Hey, hello, how are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. So that was a little bit of a, an interesting experience for us. And we knew that at that point that that was her normal as a person. And that's something that we had to adapt to meet, you know, what she was going to need, some of the challenges that, that she was going to face. And not that, you know, our devices alone are going to um, change the change the world for anyone, but it's the whole idea that you can make something help one person and then and then see that sort of spread because i'm in engineering everything's very methodical and planned out and you know we we have to do things in a certain order but with this i threw all that out the window and i had to just because it, that was the only way that i could approach it we want to show the world that there are solutions that very simple solutions sometimes um, that can really change the world for someone with extra needs. And if we can, again, keep doing that and sharing our story and sharing the stories of some of these projects and how they help, other people might get inspired and they might do the same thing. Hello there, this is Fei Wu, and I'm so glad you are here listening to the Face Royal podcast. This week, we're bringing forward a regular interview episode with Jacob LaCourse, who is the founder of Adapt the World Labs. Their mission statement is this. At Adapt the World Labs, we see the benefit of using technology to help people with extra needs. And we aim to leverage technology to solve challenges and enhance the lives of the most vulnerable among us. Jake found me while I was still on my documentary journey, immediately after I finished interviewing Mick Ebling, who is an inventor and philanthropist, Jake reached out to me. Check this out. Mick is someone I've admired and listened to for years and the founder of Not Impossible Labs, and Jake was the winner of the 2018 Not Impossible Limitless Award. What exactly is Adapt the World? It's a result of a very personal experience from Jake and why he and his wife are on a mission to adapt the world. Here's a letter they wrote uh, together, and uh, I would really like to take this opportunity to read it to you, my listener. We are the parents of two beautiful children, one of which is our two-year-old who has Usher syndrome, which is the leading cause of death blindness. When we learned of our daughter's disease, we immediately began thinking of ways to adapt the world to her needs to ultimately make it more accessible. We quickly realized that this would be no small task, but if we were to be successful, it would mean that we were not only adapting the world for her, but also for anyone else that had similar accessibility needs. Our world is full of challenges for people with disabilities. We see it now more clearly than we have ever seen before. But what we also see are the possibilities to make it more adaptable. I, Jake, am the director of engineering at a company on the East Coast and have extensive background in product development from concept to design and through manufacturing. I'm able to take many years of experience in this field and use it to develop low-cost, innovative solutions to help reach many underserved people with extra needs. We're not afraid to commit to something and then figure it out along the way on how to get it done. We have committed to adapting the world, to meet our daughter's needs, and truly feel that we can help many in the process. Hey, this interview is about possibilities and solutions we can create. We are in charge. Once again, no fancy degree, no credibility. People are already out there doing all kinds of things that inspire and help others. You too have a superpower. Don't underestimate it. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome our hero of the week, Jacob LaCourse from Adapt the World Labs to the Face World podcast. What connected us is serendipity, and it's your 
you proactively reach out to me and I stumble upon a website called Adapt the World Labs. Sound very interesting to me. But um, could you tell us a little bit about the origin story? And I just love the story of your daughter. Um, if you could tell us about what this is and why you started that. Sure. Ten years ago, my first daughter was born. Her name's Reagan. I mean, we we're just having a, a great time as a family and trying to figure out what it all meant. We we're new parents. And eight years later, we decided we were going to have a, another child. And we had all the experience of being a parent and understanding what that meant. And it was, it was uh, something that we totally had under control. And when we had our second child, we figured, yeah, you know, no big deal. Um, we're just going to raise her just like the, the, our first child, which, uh, uh, but come to find out when she was born, uh, she was born um, deaf. So that was a bit of a shock to us. So that was a little bit of a, an interesting experience for us. And we knew that at that point that that was her normal um, as a person. And that's something that we had to adapt uh, to meet, you know, what she was going to need, some of the challenges that, that she was going to face. So, mm-hmm. you know, the first eight months of her life, we were just kind of trying to figure out what that meant. So as a family, we started to learn sign language. After a while, we got really comfortable with the situation. And we said, you know what, we got this. It was this awesome community of uh, uh, deaf people that were just reaching out to us and helping us. And it is an amazing deaf culture that that I knew, never knew existed. Uh, and my wife, Beth, never knew existed. So so we, we, were, we were finally feeling like, yep, we got this. Then it was about... She was eight months old, and my wife, Beth, started to notice that she had um, what's called head lag, where her head was kind of cocked to the side at eight months, and she should have had better motor, motor function at that point. So she noticed it, and she started to look online, and of course, you know, you, you go on Facebook and all these other social media sites, and, and people start talking about these diseases that might, not, might come along with, with being deaf, and she learned of uh, Usher syndrome. That was really when, you know, first, of course, I, you know, no way that's not going to happen. It's such a rare disease. But Beth kind of knew. She, she knew that something was there. And so, so she started contacting doctors. We got some genetic testing. And that's when we found out, you know, that she did have uh, Usher syndrome. And Usher syndrome is actually the, the leading cause of deaf blindness. So we were just faced with, you know, her being deaf for the last eight, eight uh, months. And then all of a sudden, this new reality that eventually the vision would uh, go as well. So it kind of was a, a little bit of a blow to the family for sure. Yeah. What surprised me, Jake, is when you first told me, I don't have children yet, but just being uh, being a woman, just hearing that story, like I actually, you know, you couldn't see me, but I needed some time to recover from that. And Part of me realized that somehow you've gained, you and Beth and your family gained a superpower to be able to talk about this, not only calmly, but you've taken an an initiative above and beyond based on your experience, your background, your expertise that you've really taken this on, uh, not just to help your own daughter, but other children with uh, Usher syndrome as well. Could you talk about that as well? Yeah. So, you know, when... I, like, I'm an engineer, and when she was born deaf, we realized that there were just there were going to be some challenges for her. And and one of the things that we recognized, like something as simple as a child sitting in the back seat of a car, which is where they're supposed to sit, and they're supposed to be facing backwards, that um, being completely deaf would be really hard for us to um, you know communicate with her and console her if she was crying or something like that. So so I said, well, you know, I've got this background. Um, I'm just a technologist. I, I love technology. And I said, well, we'll create a little smartwatch for her. And just started to think of these different um, ideas, ways that we could sort of interact with her outside of um, what typically what you would do with a, with a hearing child. So that was always sort of you know what I what I felt I needed to do. I I needed to create these solutions uh, for her. When the blindness uh, uh, equation came came into the equation, I really then I realized that life was going to be quite difficult for her. the deafness. Easily she could have navigated um, the world. There's there's um, cochlear implants that were a possibility for us. Sign language certainly was a uh, was high on our list of uh, possibilities. But with blindness, it was just a uh, it was really hard for us to figure out how she was going to be independent um, and sort of included in, in, in society. So 
I decided what, what ended up happening. We we saw the solutions that were currently out on the market, and they were sort of antiquated, um, not really that appealing. So I saw these solutions, and and I I thought that they were there, and the world kind of felt were good enough. But I, I didn't really see it that way. I, I I wanted her to you know have the the best of everything. So one of those devices that they had was like um, a Braille toys. They have these little you know older style blocks with maybe some bumps on them or dots on them, and that's to help teach a child how to learn Braille. That's great but my older daughter reagan had all these really fun interactive toys that she could play with and that taught her how to read Mm -hmm. so i I saw this as a just something missing um for children and so i created uh, what's called the beck dot which is a a pre-braille sort of toy where she can interact with it put little toys on it and then it pops up the corresponding word and there's all kinds of lights and sound that come along with it as well and that was just something that um, you know I wanted her to have a special toy, and then I realized, uh, oh wow, this could actually help a lot of people. Um, we're making it low cost enough, so you know families could afford it. And that was a start of sort of Adapt the World Labs. Wow, could you do you remember the first iteration of the toy? What did it look like? Felt like how raw was it, and was uh, it like not even functional to start? Yeah, it was. It was. It was actually amazing. So, I was. Uh, it was. It's literally like two o'clock in the morning. I'm sitting there and I'm trying to get this little actuator to lift this braille cell, and I had to do it in such a way. Like the ways that they do it today are very complex and. That's what drives the cost of these um, Braille readers way up. I mean, they're five or ten thousand dollars for these systems. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to invent a a, um, a solution for this, and I came up with this little mechanism that would lift the Braille cell. And it was something that wasn't really done before. And it, it was like around two in the morning, and I had this like contraption on my table, and I just remember taking taking a picture of it and just totally frustrated. And I kept going. And then it was like four in the morning and then all of a sudden I got it work. And so I'm posting it all over social media. Wow. And I was just so, you know, so happy to get the thing finally up and running. And it was crude. It was, I mean, bubble gum and duct tape holding this thing together. And it, it was uh yeah, it, but it but, but 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 I knew at that point when I got it working that I was onto something and and that I could actually make this thing happen. Wow. What was Re- Rebecca like when she first saw the toy? I mean, she was one of the first, you know, a user, primary user at the time. Yeah. What was yeah. that interaction like? So it was good. So so we actually have a, um, you know, we've had a bunch of um, folks come in and videotape and and uh, uh, interview us. And in our, especially when there's a camera around for some reason, she gets this like strong reaction and this like this, I mean, her eyes light up and huge like open mouth, like this is the coolest thing in the world. The idea is not, I mean, she's, she's two and a half now. And the idea wasn't to like teach her necessarily how to read in, in Braille. It was more to get her to show that, hey, when I put this toy on this device and these little dots pop up, it must mean something. So the coolest thing for me to see and for us to see was that her just trying to mash the dots back down, trying to, you know, she's interacting with it and seeing. And, and of course, she still has her vision today. With Usher syndrome, it degrades over time. But, but that whole interaction and her understanding that now when her brain is still so plastic and still has the ability to learn is really super important. So that's that's actually, I mean, that, that, that was a super you know, proud moment for all of us when, when she really started to play with it. Yeah, I have a feeling with a dad like you and how supportive all the family and friends are because of all the things that you're trying to do without even being a professional you know, toy maker, a professional scientist with a degree in education, you're figuring things out and she's figuring out all these things along the way. There's something very collaborative and very innovative about the process. I, I don't know whether you had a moment to even think about that. Yeah, I mean, well, in our, it, with any like a toy maker or, or anyone that makes a product, one of the, one of the things that um, is one of the biggest challenges is to get the, what they call the voice of the customer. You know, understanding what your customer needs. And you know, I got my customer living with me, so it's it's really easy to get that. I've got this constant feedback loop of, you know, if she's not interested in it, then I did something wrong. So I can adjust it and tweak it until she's happy with it. And 
I've actually had a, a really a bunch of opportunities to now to show it to other blind children. Uh, and that's been really exciting too. It's it's not just seeing her reaction; it's seeing reaction of um, of some of the other uh, blind children and even blind adults um, that have have played with it as well. Well, what was what was that like? It was, it was amazing. So there was one gentleman that visited us while we were um, showing it at a show, and he had his he came up and he had his uh, seeing eye dog with him and and um, someone that was guiding him. And I was explaining to him he was I would say he's about thirty years old. And he actually worked for um, a, a device manufacturer for blind people. He was playing with it. He's, he's um, messing with the device. And he said, oh, man, if only I had this when I was a child. And that was like a v- very validating moment for us. And, and that, w- that was really cool to hear him say that. Wow. There, you're listening to the Face World podcast. Today on the show, I'm joined by Jacob LaCourse, who's the founder of Adapt the World Labs. Their mission at Adapt the World Labs is to see the benefit of using technology to help people with extra needs. And their aim is to enhance the lives of the most vulnerable among us. And what was it like for you as an, I want to call you an inventor from this point on, of interacting with people who you may or may not be able to verbalize these instructions. How did you communicate and convey this thing? Yeah, so with Usher syndrome, you have three things that uh, affect um, the body, which is your your vision, your hearing, and your uh, balance. But the devices that we're creating um, are solutions for maybe maybe one of those at a time. So like the, the Beckdot, is specifically for learning um, for for blind people. Uh, there's not a lot of blind uh, deaf blind people in the world, so it's not necessarily just for deaf blind. It's for just blind as well. So so obviously speaking verbally uh, with a blind person is just just um, as normal as I would I would speak to you. If I am communicating with a deaf person, um, I do know enough sign to to get by. Um, you know, it gives uh gives us a, a little bit of ability to communicate, even though it's a little bit shaky. Yeah, I it's something very interesting about this because it, I think we're living in a world where we're all trying to be understood and we want to be accepted, but yet you, as an adult, Jake, you are kind of tapped into a world where I would say you didn't quite used to belong, but now you're you're breaking in, and to me it's not instead of, it's in addition to. And that's why I think it's a superpower. Now you have your community and the community you're helping with. It's not just your family, but all these families you're benefiting from your invention. What, what does that feel like? I mean, for you, for you to internalize that? I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's always been um, this whole idea of, of trying to help and, and trying to do good in the world is just, you know, a part of who I am. This has just really sort of brought that to the forefront. Um, I mean, it can it can be powerful, and and not that you know our devices alone are gonna um, change the change the world for anyone, but it's the whole idea that you can make something help one person, and then and then see that sort of spread for years and years. And this is back before Rebecca um, was ever uh, was born. I drive down to the office. I've been drive into my office for you know 20 years same route and I drive through this little village and this this woman for I don't know the past 15 years has been out in the morning picking up trash along the road and I've always thought I'm like wow you know this is amazing this this one woman's out here and she's trying to she's making the community better for everyone and then all of a sudden you know, three years go by and I see another person and then there's another person and now I drive through that village and there's five people on any given day with their trash bags picking up trash and I sort of see this what we're doing as sort of a similar thing where if we can show that you, know, you can spend you know use your skill set to solve a problem then maybe other people will will see that and and then do something good for society. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about your relationship with the Not Impossible Lab and also Mick Ebling, the founder of that lab. So what? yeah, well, what's your relationship with that company? Yeah. So this goes back, it was last uh, last year when, when I actually learned of Not Impossible. 
what ended up happening, again, I had mentioned I had always sort of had this idea that I certainly I knew about Rebecca's diagnosis before I learned about Not Impossible. And I, but I knew that, hey, if I could take my skill set and apply it to, to create solutions, uh, but I still didn't really understand what that meant. And I was at a medical uh, sensors um, conference and a gentleman by the name of David, David Petrino who was a neuroscientist, he was talking um, to a group of people. And, you know, you think of a neuroscientist like this very super polished, not that he isn't, but uh, he's up there and on the podium and he's he's just having, you know, he's up there and he's got these funny slides up there and this and, and uh, talking about how he kind of just didn't really know what he was doing at some times. And and uh, and then he mentioned this this group, not impossible. He met he uh, mentioned not, um, Mick Ebling and how he was doing some work with uh, a boy in um, Daniel, and he mm-hmm. was 3D printing an arm for for Daniel. And he mentioned a book. I grabbed the book. I read the book in like you know fast as I've ever read a book. It takes me about months to read. It takes me months to read a book, but I read that book in about two days. <laughs> And I started following the group and I started following Not Impossible and I, you know, I hooked up with their social media and connected with them and I shared a, um, they had a contest going on, um, you know, the, the uh, Not Impossible award they were calling it. And I shared that uh, with my network and actually a cousin of mine said, hey, I really hope you're, you're going to go after that. And I, so it was around the time when I was I mentioned that I was just getting the Beck dot going um, and sort of going through those challenges of of getting it running, and I submitted to to the project and and uh, a couple weeks later I get a call from their 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 crew and um, I mean just met these amazing people uh, over the phone and you know during the discussion I didn't think that I really had a shot because I figured just you know thousands of people applying for yeah. this thing and with all kinds of you know, better ideas than I had. But then at the end of the conversation, they started to talk about next steps. And I'm going, oh, wait a minute, maybe I have a chance. But they still didn't tell me that I, I was a winner of one of the awards until about two weeks later. And, and Mick himself gave me a call. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was just really cool because, you know, he, he said something to the effect of, you know, you're the quintessential, you know, idea of what we're trying to do. And, and that was just a really cool moment for Beth and I. We were sitting, uh, sitting in the car on, a, on the speakerphone with Mick. So it was cool. But then <laughs> once we won the award, I realized that I had a lot of work to do. So it was uh, the next two months just really working on, uh, on uh, finishing up the, the Beck dot. Um, how would you describe the connection with, I love what you said about connecting with Mick or people like Mick and you went from this engineer in the basement to meeting someone to say, well, I don't know, maybe what you're doing isn't crazy or weird or, you know, what does that feel like to you? Well, yeah. And that's, that's the thing. It was, you know, exactly what you said. It's, it's, um, I did for a while think that, you know, I, this is nuts. I'm never going to be able to, you know, get this thing or anyone to even see it, you know, let alone actually want it. And now I got people emailing me constantly and saying, when is it going to be done? Because they want it for their children. So to see Mick and his, you know, his whole idea around, you know, just not knowing what the hell he's doing and then figuring out as he goes along was exactly what I was doing. I had no idea. I mean, we had no idea, you know, how to live with a deaf deaf person, how to live with a blind person, but we were kind of figuring it all out. Because I'm in engineering, everything's very methodical and planned out. And, you know, we we have to do things in a certain order. But with this, I threw all that out the window and I had to just because it, that was the only way that I could approach it. So that whole, you know, sort of commit and figure it out later was something that really resonated with me. And, and that's, that's sort of their whole, um, you know, one, one of their, their, their whole mindsets. Hi there, you're listening to the Face World Podcast. Today on the show, I'm joined by Jacob LaCourse, who's the founder of Adapt the World Labs. Their mission at Adapt the World Labs is to see the benefit of using technology to help people with extra needs. And their aim is to enhance the lives of the most vulnerable among us. Could you tell us, we still haven't talked about, what type of engineer are you? Yeah, uh, so, so it's interesting. So I, you know, the whole maker movement, right? The, yeah. 
this idea of you know trying to use tools and technology that's out there and sort of hack it and make your own thing. I was a maker when I was probably five years old. I I started to take everything apart, and you know, my my parents thankfully they were supportive, and you know, they'd always find my toys ripped apart in a million pieces. And I was always just tinkering with things. And I ended up uh, when I when I was about sixteen, I started with this company, Onset Computer, and they're down on the Cape. Um, we were about twenty five people at the time, and uh, I was in high school, and I was sort of doing a co op thing, and and I started to uh, realize that. This is a type of place where problems are solved, and and I really enjoyed solving problems, and you know, and I, and I enjoyed technology. And they were making these uh, little uh, environmental data loggers, mm-hmm. and I I really grew with the company. So I was in production, manufacturing, product development, and eventually started in electrical engineering. I did some mechanical engineering. I got some school behind me. They were super supportive. I had. You know, numerous mentors throughout the year, and ultimately, I became the director of engineering. And between myself and my counterpart, we've we, there's 40 engineers that uh, on our team. So I'm a hardware engineer, if that, or product development engineer is really what my where I focus. Mm-hmm. So I want to move on to the the marketing side of things. A lot of people who are listening to the podcast have ideas bubbling. Uh, a lot of them are actually creators themselves being, you know, artists and performing arts or podcasters. So the biggest challenge a lot of people say or are facing are how to get their message out to the world. And I think for you to join a competition, make Ebeling endorsed uh, you, your brand, your family story, that is amazing. But yet there's always that on a day-to-day basis, like how do you think about marketing and how do you get the message out so more people will find out? I we want to, you know, with the brand and and what we're trying to do, that's a that's really a vehicle for us to not only bring these solutions to market, but also um, tell the world about uh, Usher syndrome. And what what ends up uh, what ended up happening is I, you know, I found the maker community, and I was able to share the projects that I was doing. And it's not just the Beck dot. There's the Beck dot. I have a visual acuity puzzle. There's a you know interactive visual acuity puzzle some smart lighting solutions for visually impaired people. And to share those projects in those platforms, I mean, there's millions of people that see this. Um, so it's connecting with those, those communities and, and, um, and leveraging uh, the people that want to help you in those communities and also providing help to people that are trying to come up in those communities. So you sort of... Those projects get uh, shared within the communities, and then they they actually expand outside of the communities as well. So that's really where we're, where um, the the marketing piece it's sharing. It's really about um, sharing the ideas, not holding them close to my vest, and just you know. And I, I know a lot of inventors just you know they try to hold it close and don't want to don't want to tell. And that's important in some cases, but in this case, it's it's the opposite. You want to share. You want to you want to show people some of the challenges that you're facing as you're trying to create these solutions and just kind of getting out there to the world. I mean, it reminded me that what you just said was my experience looking at all the uh, Not Impossible Labs first iterations of the iRider. I just remember them lined up. There's like, and also with the um, the 3D arms, there were like six of them and they had more and be able to see so many iterations. And today, the Korean company, Chinese company is all these companies from all parts of the world are trying to, because it's open source and trying to make these products better and help more people along the way. So just like you said, if Mick or yourself held these products so closely that other people will not be engaged and we're, you know, later on, I maybe that this thing will go beyond yourself. Maybe it is about, who knows, like Philips or, you know, like Siemens or something to pick it up and make it better. Yeah, you, you know, you mentioned Philips and and I created this smart light uh, solution and I used a Philips product and I reached out to him and I shot him an email and I said, hey, look at this cool thing I did with your product. And then they started to send me equipment that I could use. So so that's another way to, to get your ideas to um, uh, move forward is to get the support of like the companies of the, the components that you're using and um, showing some of those marketing teams, which you know are marketing teams of you know 5,000, uh, that their products are being used for 
you know, sort of a, a better society a little bit. And, and they latch onto that. They like those, those types of stories so that they, they're willing to help. Mm, yeah. So, so I guess what is next for you, Jake? That it, it seems like you're juggling still a lot of balls in the air. You got two kids, you got a family, lovely wife, you work full time. And how, how do you balance of this? Where do you go next? We want to take Adaptor World Labs and we want to start, you know, um, contributing to the movement. I don't want to say create a movement because it's already there, but we want to contribute to it. We want to we want to show the world that there are solutions that very simple solutions sometimes um, that can really change the world for someone with extra needs. And if we can again keep doing that and sharing our story and sharing the stories of some of these projects and how they help, other people might get inspired and they might do the same thing. When we think of adapting the world, it's it's a uh, you know thinking of uh, creating an environment where a child could you know feel a little bit more included because they have a cool toy to play with, like a braille toy, and and bring other people in. It's about uh, sharing our stories so people in our community can learn about Rebecca and some of the challenges that she might face, and and they may be in their everyday lives thinking about, hey, you know, maybe we should paint these stairs so that she could see a little bit better. Um, or people in general can see a little bit better. So, so that's what we mean by adapting the world. It's uh, just the little, little, um, little things that, that can make such a huge difference. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Jake. I really appreciate your time. Um, this was a fantastic interview. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And, and thank you for the time. And, and uh, we love, love to be able to share our story. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoyed what you heard, it would be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Face World podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Face World podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.